Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 323rd episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together educating and inspiring you to become part of your food revolution. Raising farm animals in your backyard is not just rewarding, it's actually easier than you think, especially when you have Kari Spencer to help get you prepared. Just text CHICKENS to 33444 or visit BackyardFarmAnimals.com and you'll receive our free webinar on how to raise chickens, goats, and more, promote biodiversity, and put your backyard animals to work. Today on our podcast, we have someone who is truly dedicated to helping others gain confidence in growing food. We're talking with my good friend and returning guest, Kari Spencer, about farming in the city. Kari is a popular local gardening and homesteading speaker. As a master gardener and a master farmer, she enjoys sharing her passion for growing and raising food with others. In addition to teaching classes all over the city of Phoenix, she is the creator of the Urban Farm Use Growing Food the Basics and Backyard Livestock courses. She and her family operate the Microfarm Project, a small farm in North Phoenix where gardens and livestock animals provide her family with fun and food. Her new book, City Farming, How to Guide to Growing Crops and Raising Livestock in Urban Spaces by 5M Publishing has just been released, and that's what we're talking about today. Welcome back to the show, Kari. Are you ready to rock urban farming? I am always up for that, Greg. (laughs) This I actually know about you. So we already got to meet you in podcast episodes 3 and 33. Let's talk about your new book and all the excitement around it. What was the first thought for you to actually write this book? How did it happen? Well, I've been considering writing a book. I've I've been blogging quite a lot about things that we're doing at the Microfarm Project, and that was really fun for me. I love to put things and ideas down on paper, and I hadn't really thought about putting an actual book together, but 5M Publishing contacted me and said, hey, we've been following your blog. Any chance you want to put all of this stuff that you've been blogging about into a book form? Wow. And that idea just really resonated with me. As soon as I read that email, I got so excited about it. And I could just see the potential immediately in my mind. That was about three years ago. And here we are today. Finally, the book is in publication and it's been quite a journey. It's been three years since you got that email. Yes, three years. Wow, time flies. I I actually remember you sharing that. You know, it just blows me away sometimes how quickly time flies, especially, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm 56 these days. As I'm getting older, it's going faster, you know? That's the truth. So the book starts with planning for harvest and prepping for food preparation. That's a curious place to start. Why did you start there? Well, normally that's put at the end of a gardening book, but I really wanted to put that right at the front because I have found over and over again with my students that they get really excited about growing and they have success and they end up with a big harvest that they don't know what to do with. Or they're just not quite prepared for all the work that goes into harvesting and preserving food. Mm -hmm. And so the harvest goes to waste. Either it just rots on the vine or they pick it, bring it in the house and it rots in the house or they end up just giving it away because they don't know what to do. That is really a shame. And so I wanted to make sure that before people even start growing and raising food, that they have a picture that's very clear in their mind about what they're going to do with all the stuff that they're going to produce. And this gets really exciting. It makes people excited to grow, but it also helps keep the momentum going throughout the entire process so that at the end, they have a pantry full of home-produced foods. And that is very, very satisfying. That is one of the biggest challenges when you are growing your own food, because one of the things I've seen over and over again in over 40 years of growing food is that there's no lack of abundance when you start gardening. You will get an amazing harvest. And it is a challenge to know what you do with 50 pounds of carrots, right? Right. Yeah. All at once. Right. Things tend to come at you. I mean, how much kale can you eat in a three month period? You have to do something with it. One of the great things about growing and preserving foods is that you can create incredible conveniences as well. Because sometimes people think, oh, I'm going to grow food and it's going to take up a lot of my time. 
And then I have to actually cook with it, which is going to take more time. It's just easier to go to the grocery store and buy something prepackaged or hit the drive through line. But if you are really prepared in advance for the harvest, you can create some extreme convenience at your home. So with just a few hours of preserving some food, Mm -hmm. you've got it on the shelf in your pantry so that when you're figuring out, oh, what are we going to eat tonight? You can just walk into your pantry, grab something off the shelf and have a plan to make something very quickly that's healthy and economical and doesn't take you a lot of time. That is one of the ideas I really wanted to share with my readers because that actually transformed my thoughts all about gardening and farming, as well as practice that I was able to put into place to make a healthier lifestyle for myself and for my family. Yeah. And you know, that's really the big thing. You have a story that you tell about you were on your way to a fair or something and you stopped at a convenience store. Why don't you share that? Because it is a really impactful one. Yeah, I write about this in the book in detail so you can get a really clear picture of the story. But I had an aha moment that struck me with my children on the way to an agricultural fair. Uh We were in a hurry and I thought, okay, kids, just get in the car and we'll stop and get some gas. And y'all can run into the convenience store and grab a hot dog. And then we'll head down to the ag fair, which now that I look at that, how ironic was that? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make any sense. In the moment, I was stressed. And that's what I wanted to do. So we stopped at the convenience store. They ran inside. And I pumped gas and they didn't come out. So I had to go in and get them. It took us an extra half an hour, you know, just for everybody to decide what they were going to get. Right. And then I had to throw in an extra $5. It cost us $25 to get junk at the convenience store. We get in the van and all I can smell is this awful smell that I'm wondering is going to be ground into the carpets of my minivan. Then I thought, well, if I can't stand the smell here, this is the stuff that's getting into my children's bodies. Right. What am I doing? I just spent $25 and 30 minutes of time for junk when we could have made peanut butter jelly sandwiches at home and picked some lettuce out of the garden and had a nice salad in less time. Yeah. Made with jam probably out of your, your garden. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's when my mind changed about what convenience. Mm -hmm. I no longer saw the convenience store as convenient at all. (laughs) Exactly. I shop at a convenience store for one thing. It's called gas for my vehicle. And it just happens to be attached to a convenience store. And when I walk in there to pay or use the restroom, I look through the space and there is literally nothing that I would consider real food that I would eat in those places. Yeah, that's true for me now. Yeah. And, you know, when we're getting it in our yard, we're getting it fresh and happy and nutrient dense and so on and so on. So as you kind of process through this book and getting it done, was there a moment that you can look back to and stand back and say, oh, my gosh, that is epic. Something happened. You know, you visited farms in the process of writing this book. What one moment do you think back and remember that was just absolutely epic? One of the farms that I visited absolutely blew me away. In the spring of 2016, I went out for the grand opening of a community garden in New York City. But this just wasn't any community garden. This is a community garden on the roof of a centuries-old church in Hell's Kitchen. Wow. No elevator in the building, only walk up to the top floor. And they had been able to create an amazing community garden up there, right on the roof, using space that would otherwise just be empty. They used a bucket brigade to get all the soil up to the top of the roof. And because they could not reinforce the roof enough just to put a regular garden up there, like a raised bed, Uh they ended up growing in plastic children's swimming pools. Oh, wow couple dozen of these. Uh They had all these little gardens all over the roof and dozens and dozens of people up there excited about growing food. And the purpose of the garden was to grow food for the food pantry that is hosted in the basement of the church. Wow. That was just so amazing and exciting to me. You know, where we live in Phoenix, there's all kinds of space. We're not crowded at all here. Mm -hmm. But in New York City, space is at a premium. And the growers there are getting extremely creative. 
in how they're growing. I have hydroponic gardens on roof, restaurants with gardens on the roof, and then this community garden up there in the sky. Wow. And I thought that was so amazing and so cool. And the most amazing part of it was seeing all the people that were coming out who wanted to learn how to grow food. They did that by volunteering to help somebody else. To me, that is just the essence of what a community garden is all about. Yeah. And I've kept in contact with those folks. What was the name of that farm? It's the Hell's Kitchen Farm Project, which you can go out and check out at hkfp.org. I really recommend going out and looking at their website. It's very cool. It might give some people ideas about how they could grow if they have limited space as well. Nice. And you got to go to New York City. I, I absolutely, I've been there a few times. I absolutely love New York City and the work they're doing there. Me too. You know, around growing your own food. So what is really the idea behind this book? What do you hope for people to get out of it? There are two things that I'd like people to get out of it. The first is that in the book, I include a lot of just basic how-tos. How do you grow food? What do you need to know to do that? How do you raise animals? What are the very basic things that you need to know to get started? But I also include a lot of examples, stories, and ideas that people can connect to to spark creativity. Because when you're starting an urban farm, these opportunities are endless of how you create that farm. And how you put it together is really up to you. There are no limits to it. So I really wanted people to see different things that people are doing in this urban farm realm, you know, to just gain ideas that they can take and implement on their own farm to make the process really exciting and to tailor it to people's lifestyles and what they want to accomplish. And was it a lot of fun writing it? It was a blast to write because, first of all, I really loved the topic. I could talk about it all day long. But secondly, I met the most amazing people along the way. I think the urban farmers are among the most interesting people, the most open people to share ideas and to just be friendly. And it was an incredibly fun project to put together. So you started with creating real convenience and true abundance. And then you jump in chapters two through about eight are really about growing, actually how to grow food, talking about making room for your abundance, talking about the changing seasons and so on and so on. But what I'm really curious about is toward the end of the book, you talk about going beyond sustainability and you dive into the ecological functions of your space. Can you say more about that? That is one of the real aha moments that I had in my farming process. You know, when we started out, I really didn't know anything about sustainability. I didn't know a lot about being quote unquote green. I didn't know anything about being regenerative, really. I just knew that I wanted to grow some stuff and have fun doing it. And what I discovered along the way was that my farm can really be a part of the regeneration of our climate, of our planet. And that got me extremely excited because it made my farm bigger than something that just was happening in my backyard. It was contributing to the ecology of my community. That got me really excited, but it also discouraged me a little bit because having put my farm together without any knowledge of this at all, mm -hmm. Or with just a basic understanding of it, my farm was actually not sustainable and it was actually, I think, detrimental. And I'll give you an example. We had goats, which I adored. They were so fun and the milk from them was beautifully fantastic. However, I had to truck in bales and bales and bales of hay to feed those animals. Is that very sustainable? Mm, right. It wasn't. As far as economics, it was extremely expensive to do. Mm -hmm. It also required a lot of fuel to accomplish. <laughs> it just didn't seem to me like that was very a very good option. Also, the waste from my animals. There was no way that I could compost all of that waste for my own backyard. And so the city wanted me just to bag it and throw it away. You know, we came up with a creative solution that we ended up giving it away to other people to compost. And that seemed to work. But if I had done a little bit of prior planning and thought through what can I grow on my own property to support my goats, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had to truck in all that hay and my farm would have been much, much more sustainable. And the idea is actually to go beyond 
sustainability to regeneration. So everything that I'm doing on my farm, all the systems that I'm putting in place, they should become as self-sustaining and regenerative as possible. So if I have these goats on my property and I am growing things on the property that I can use to feed them, then I'm not using the resource of fuel to get that food to right. my goat. And then they're eating that food, creating milk, which is a useful product for my family. Mm -hmm. And then the waste that comes from those animals, if I don't have too much, I can compost it, put it back in the soil, grow more things for them to eat, and it becomes a circle that is more productive. It actually has more produced by the system than I have to put into the system, either work-wise or economically or resource-wise. Chapter 9 of your book is Taking the Long View, Going Beyond Sustainability on Your Farm. You talk about ecological functions. Can you share a few of these ecological functions with people so that they get a sense of what you mean by that? Sure. I'm going to give you just a handful. There are many ecological functions to an urban farm, but on our farm in particular, I would say maybe our top three would be planting things that are of benefit to the bees. Mm -hmm. so I like to have a lot of things that flower to help the bees because as many of us know, bees are struggling in population. And so I like to encourage them. And so my farm has beautiful flowers and has flowering edible plants that are great for us to eat. But that's also a benefit to the bees, mm -hmm. to something bigger and greater than my farm itself. Right? And it's really a win-win situation because I need bees for pollination. Right. But I'm also helping the bee population in general in the area in which I live. So that's really exciting and satisfying to me. We're also doing soil building. Mm -hmm. We're composting and we're taking waste out of the waste stream out of the landfill and using it to create beautiful, wonderful soil to grow great plants. Mm -hmm for our family. And so that is reducing the stress on our landfills and creating this wonderful soil that's great for all of the microbes that are living in it, for the earthworms. It's a much bigger picture than just growing some food in my backyard. Yeah. And ecological functions when we're looking to put those in place, really what we're doing is we're looking for workers in our space. So talking about chickens, let's jump in and talk about chickens a little bit. What do your chickens do in your space? Because they're actually doing work for us and helping. Yeah, they are. You know, I could bring chickens in my backyard and kind of just see them as a pet and they're a lot of work for me. Mm -hmm. But instead, I see them as a productive member of my farm. So we are actually trading. I'm feeding them, giving them a wonderful place to live, and they are helping me to compost. You know, I just let them into my compost pile. They scratch around. They help to break that down. They provide waste that is a great fertilizer for my garden. And they're doing a lot of that composting work for me. Mm -hmm. And then they give me eggs. <laughs> You know, that's a wonderful scenario. And I don't have to go in there and clean up after them too often because they're out on my property actually cleaning up the property for me, eating all of the little things that fall on the ground that I would otherwise have to rake up. And they're just a wonderful resource and they're fun to watch too. Yeah. Well, one of the things I noticed about our chickens, I let them kind of free range in our backyard during the day. They actually are pretty good lawn mowers. You know, when I when I have them out in the backyard, they're mowing the lawn for me. I'm not having to do that. Oh, certainly, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then they don't eat as much bagged feed, right? Exactly. So they're cheaper to keep, and they're doing a job. They're actually healthier because they're getting that green grass and that varied diet. I don't see any downside to the situation. So you visited for chapter nine each each one of your chapters you actually go out and visit a farm and in chapter nine you visited or the feature farm is tara rose fertile farms tell us about that space well that is a space in cottonwood arizona a good friend of mine who started out as one of my students in a sustainability and conscious living class and then she ended up taking a class on designing a farm and she invited me up to see her project, to see what she was actually doing in real life. Mm -hmm. And I went up there and 
I was so excited to see that she was putting all of the things that she was learning into practice. And what she was designing was a permaculture property. And, you know, permaculture, as you aptly described, is the art and science of working with nature. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what she was doing. And she lives in an area where people often try to get water off of their property. Mm. It's very wet, which is unusual for Arizona. Oh, yeah. And they were having areas that were getting flooded and all their neighbors were just trying to divert that water and get rid of it. And she was thinking about how can we use this water? Right. What can we do with it? And I just thought that that was so cool. You know, just a departure from the standard thinking. She was seeing it as a resource, as an asset rather than you know, a problem. Something to throw away. Yeah, so it's been fun to follow their farm, Susan and John Graves, to follow Mm -hmm. them over the years and to see what they're doing. And, you know, people are really starting to create some unique and interesting properties, and they're all so different. Her farm is extremely different from mine, so it was a lot of fun to go up and see kind of the different strategies that she had to put in place compared to what I do down here in the desert. Yeah, well, and really in permaculture, As we've learned over the years, it's about looking at your space and seeing what's going to work in the flow of nature in your space. Isn't that the case? Yes, that is true. And, you know, also looking at your space and seeing things in a different light. A lot of times we look around our properties and we see problems. Mm. Oh, that spot's too hot, Sunny. That spot's too shady. Oh, there's a slope there. You know, all these things that traditionally we would say are not ideal places for growing food. On a farm, you know, a big farm, they just clear the land. Mm -hmm. Right. But in our backyards, you know, we don't necessarily want to clear the land, but we can make use of all those different little microclimates, little spaces in our yard that vary from the surrounding climate. So, you know, we live in Phoenix where it's hot and sunny, but I'm looking out in my backyard right now as we're talking and I can see this big grapefruit tree that is casting beautiful shade. On a commercial farm, they would say, you know, you got to take that tree out because it's too shady over there and we can't grow anything. That space is wasted. But in my yard, I'm looking at that thinking, that'd be a great place to put my chickens under there. Mm -hmm. That'd be a great place to grow some greens later into the summer. Now, there's a whole lot of things that I can do with a shaded spot. I can put my water harvesting there so that it's not in the direct sunlight. Yeah just making use of what you've got and working with what nature has provided, that just makes things easier, a lot more interesting, and actually can create some huge productivity. Beautiful. So in chapter 11, it's called We End at the Beginning. And there is a subchapter in here called Inventing Your Farm. Can you kind of, for people out there that haven't embraced urban farmerhood yet, can you kind of touch on that Give them some ideas on how they could go about inventing their farm. Sure. I put a lot of really easy exercises into the book where people can start taking a look at their space and planning what they're going to do with their property. When I started out with our first property, I didn't plan anything. You know, it turned into a really ramshackle, crazy, fun, amazing urban farm. But it could have been a whole lot better if I had put a little bit of thought and preparation into the planning before I started. And so now we have moved our farm actually to a different location for various reasons, which you can read about in the book. Uh And I'm starting over on a brand new piece of property. So I get to do all the stuff that I wish I could have done on my previous property. Yep. And so we are right now in this phase of actually inventing our farm. So I'm right there with anybody who's reading the book and just starting out. So we've been in this property for one year and I've been taking time to just go out and observe. And that's the first thing that I tell people to do. Go out and look at your property, see what you have, see where the sun shines, where the shade is, just all of the different unique aspects of your property. Get to know that really well, because that's going to help you to plan a really great backyard farm. And the second thing that I would really encourage people to do as they are inventing their farms is to think of two or three elements 
that they want to include on their farm. And often those three things are a garden, people want to grow food, a compost pile, which goes hand in hand right. with growing a garden. And then if they want to have livestock, really the starter livestock for many people are chickens. We call them the gateway livestock, mm -hmm. right? Once you get chickens, you're really an urban farmer at that point. Yeah. <laughs> Those three elements, we don't want to put them in isolation. We want to think about how can these three elements work together and support each other? Right. How do you thread them together? Right. So as I am right now in the process of building my chicken coop and building my garden, I'm thinking, where should I put my compost pile so that it's really convenient and easy to access for my chickens and for me to be able to get that compost into my garden? So I decided that I am going to put my chicken coop together and then I'm going to build gardens that are the exact dimensions of my chicken coop. So I'm going to have five or six gardens and we will move the chickens from garden to garden to garden as the seasons change. The chickens will get the benefit of being able to eat all of the plants that are at the end of season that we're done harvesting from. They'll be able to clean up that area for me. And as they're living in there, they'll be fertilizing it. I can put all of my kitchen scraps that I would normally throw into a compost pile. I can just put it right in to the chicken run that is on the garden. They can compost it down right there in place. I don't have to move compost anywhere. I think it's just going to be an easy system. I guess yeah. we'll find out how it works. It's a big experiment, as all these things are. But I'm always trying to make the system easier, more ecologically sound, more economically sound, and be creative and have fun with it. If yeah. it works, it works. If it doesn't, we'll try something else. Well, our, our friend Don Titmus over at Bee Oasis out in Mesa, he actually does this with his chickens. He's got four four gardens for four seasons. And each three months he moves the garden. So he'll move the chicken coop to the next garden bed and replant the one he just, one the chickens just finished with. And it, that works quite well. Yeah, makes sense to me. Perfect. So do you have any last thoughts for our listeners? Yeah, I do. I've got a couple of thoughts. The first one is that if you want to take a look at the book, Amazon does have a look inside. So you can go to Amazon and look at city farming and you can read quite a few pages of the book and get an idea of whether it's something that could benefit you or not. And as you're looking through it, you'll see that there are QR codes and links in the book. Mm -hmm. I only had 350 pages wow. to write. And there's so much, there's so much that could be written about urban farming. So I connected the book to a website, cityfarmingbook.com. And that way, if I didn't have room in the book to write about something that I thought was really interesting or important, I could put a link to the website so that people can get a lot more information if they want it, or if they just want to keep it simple and stick with what's in the book, that's great too. So you can look for those links, or even if you don't have a copy of the book, you can check out cityfarmingbook.com. There's a lot of free information there for readers. Perfect. Secondly, I want to encourage people to keep things very simple. If you're just starting out, think of just two or three things that you really want to grow and start there. Learn how to be a successful gardener on just a handful of things before you start to just go crazy and put mm -hmm. in massive garden beds. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Because you don't have to do it all at once. Yeah. You know, you'll learn things along the way that will change the original plan that you have in mind. And so if you're going slowly and putting things together step by step, then you can adjust as you learn along the way and you won't make huge mistakes that need to be undone, which is what we did. Yeah. You know, start simply and just have fun. There are going to be things that work, things that don't work. You're going to kill some plants. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have a chicken maybe die on your farm. And, you know, that's just part of it. And it's a small part. Most of it is amazing fun, satisfaction, and success. Well, I just want to encourage people that they can do it and to give it a try and to start simple. And have fun. And have fun. Well, thank you so much for joining us 
on the show today once again, Kari. Thanks for having me, Greg. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Oh my gosh, right back at you. So Kari's book, City Farming, How to Guide to Growing Crops and Raising Livestock in Urban Spaces. It's by 5M Books. You can actually get a 20% discount on it right now at 5mbooks.com and use the code CF20 for a 20% discount on the book. So how else can our listeners get a hold of you? They can go to cityfarmingbook.com and check out all of the free resources that are there. If they want to read about our former farm, the Micro Farm Project, which has now moved, but you can see what we did on the old property, that's at the microfarmproject.com. And those are probably the two best ways to find me. Perfect. You can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash city farming. We are your urban farming resource. You can find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, podcasts, webinars, courses, and more. And if you want to hear more from Kari, remember she was on episode three and episode 33. You can go to urbanfarm.org and search for Kari, K-A-R-I, and they will come up. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Raising farm animals in your backyard is not just rewarding, it's actually easier than you think, especially when you have Kari Spencer to help get you prepared. Just text CHICKENS to 33444 or visit BackyardFarmAnimals.com and you'll receive our free webinar on how to raise chickens, goats, and more, promote biodiversity, and put your backyard animals to work. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.